The Tom Woods Show, episode 970. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. We're talking about George Orwell today. We all love George Orwell, and yet we have this sneaking suspicion there's something not quite right about him in terms of his views. We're going to try and get to the bottom of that today with David Ramsey Steele, who is the author of a brand new book on this subject called Orwell, Your Orwell, A Worldview on the Slab. David is the author of numerous other books. The one I knew him for before this one was called From Marx to Mises, Post-Capitalist Society and the Challenge of Economic Calculation. He's been, since 1985, editorial director of Open Court Publishing. And, of course, we'll have his book linked at tomwoods.com slash 970. David, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Orwell is such a fascinating figure. I've had my friend Brad Berzer on to talk about him because he's a science fiction fan and, and he's a, had a lot to say about Orwell and others. But Orwell's been a, a bit of a puzzle to a lot of people because, as you note in the book, on the one hand, he seems to have some socialist sympathies. And on the other hand, he's extremely anti-totalitarian. And this has led to all kinds of scholarly debates about 1984 and his intentions there. This couldn't be an anti-socialist novel. Why? Well, because we know he had socialist sympathy. So therefore, before even looking at it, we know what it must be about. Hard to sort out. So you have to look through his novels and through his correspondence and his writings to figure out what exactly he was driving at. Let me ask you from the beginning, is the George Orwell who has his early novels, let's say before Animal Farm, is he the same person ideologically, that we see in 1984? Um, He underwent a conversion to socialism in the middle of 1936 while he was working on The Road to Wigan Pier, which appeared in early 1937. So the works he wrote before that were the works of a non-socialist, whereas the works he wrote from Wigan Pier on are the works of a committed dedicated socialist. I mean, I think it would be misleading to say he had socialist sympathies. He was a very dogmatic, ideologically committed socialist from 1936 on. Now, um, there are continuities in his thinking from his pre-socialist works like uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, Burmese Days. Um, many, many, Many of the themes of his thinking are the same before he was a socialist and after he became a socialist. Uh, And when we say he became a socialist in mid-1936, what we mean is that he favoured a system of society in which the government owned everything and everybody worked for the government uh, and everybody's incomes were more or less the same. Uh, So that's George Orwell. That's his, uh, it sounds surprising, but that's, uh, that's what he believed. So we're not just dealing with somebody who believed in like a modern Scandinavian so-called socialism. We're This is the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing that in 2015, Bernie Sanders, uh, who, as everybody knows, calls himself a socialist and asked to define what socialism was, he pointed to Denmark, uh, which in 2015, according to uh, one uh, authoritative uh, account, was slightly closer to laissez-faire capitalism than the United States. Um, I think in 2016, it went the other way slightly, but they're neck and neck uh, in in uh, being a mixture of government involvement and and capitalism. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this would have been unthinkable to Orwell. Orwell Orwell's socialism uh, was not of that kind. He, he, he didn't encompass welfare state capitalism or anything like that. Uh, that was not socialism. Um, and it was not socialism among the 1930s British left. They, they wouldn't have recognized, they, if you describe present day Denmark to them, they would have said, um, oh, that's capitalism. And Orwell would have said exactly the same thing. Now, the key question that occurs to me is, how can you favor a system like that, which is going to mean massive, massive state involvement in the lives of the citizenry on all levels, and then write a dystopian novel about what may happen someday if present trends continue? Well, what would you expect would happen in a regime that has to be intervening to to maintain that level of equality? You'd have to be intervening in every almost every single decision a person makes – 
and you would need a, a static society. You would need to clamp down on ideas. There's no sense that he connected one to the other. Well, I think that one thing that you have to understand about Orwell is that quite apart from being in favor of socialism or capitalism or anything like that, he was deeply convinced that capitalism was at the end of its rope, that it couldn't last much longer. So he believed that uh, regardless of what anybody wanted, uh, some kind of collectivism was coming in the very near future and was going to supplant capitalism. Uh, so he didn't think that was a matter for choice. He didn't think you had the choice of keeping capitalism. I mean, he, he didn't want to keep capitalism, but he didn't think that was an option at all. So like most British socialists in the 1930s, uh, he wanted to combine socialism, it meaning government ownership and central planning, uh, with democracy uh, and civil liberties. And that was that was a common view. That was not unique to Orwell. That was a that was the general view, I think, among among the British left in the 1930s. Now, as time went on, um, he began to have doubts about about whether that was possible. Uh, and he, as he puts it in one place, uh, he 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 looks at the possibility that economic totalitarianism must lead to political totalitarianism. Uh, that becomes a worry of his, and uh, and so. Um, when he when he's writing 1984, he, he, the alternative, the only alternative he can see to that kind of system, that which he calls oligarchical collectivism, would be uh, collective economic collectivism to the same degree, but with um, democracy and uh, civil liberties. Um, and he has he, he does doubt that it's possible towards the end. Uh, and he, so he thinks that maybe the future is going to be totalitarianism, uh, regardless of what we might do. He, he, he shifts his position in very subtle ways. But, in, but one point he makes is uh, we've seen collectivism uh, in, um, in the Soviet Union and we've seen it in the Third Reich in Germany. Uh, but we don't know what would happen if we had collectivism in a society with a strong liberal tradition. Uh, and we'll find out then whether it's possible to uh, to have economic collectivism without totalitarianism. I'm looking at your table of contents for this quite interesting book, and each chapter looks at Orwell from a different angle, in, in effect. So there's a chapter, The Anti-Imperialist, for example. But you've got one after the other, a chapter called The Socialist and a chapter called The Post-Socialist. Now, for people who have trouble making sense of all these labels, what's the difference between those? Well, I maintain that this is, this is um, sort of one of the original theses of the book. Uh, I maintain that socialism suffered a huge setback in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, such that in the early 20th century, uh, intellectuals felt that social, many intellectuals felt that socialism was discredited. But they felt that socialism was discredited because the, the whole idea of progress and rationality was discredited. They didn't, they didn't think, oh, socialism, you know, isn't progress and rationality, uh, therefore we've got to go to something else. Uh, they felt that the whole idea of confidence in human pro, the optimism uh, confidence in human progress and human rationality was misplaced. And this is why you get the, 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 the strange phenomenon that uh, in, the in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, the intellectuals who are politically active are nearly all left wing. But the great creative artists of the time, in, in the estimation of nearly everybody, like T.S. Eliot and uh, D.H. Lawrence and uh, <clears throat> people like this, um, uh, you know, um, Yeats, the, the Irish poet, they're all right wing, but they're right wing in a particular way. Uh, they're against progress, essentially. They're reacting against progress. So my argument is this, that, that Orwell was a post-socialist before he became a socialist. And when he became a socialist, he remained a post-socialist. In other words, he had these attitudes of disdain for progress and rationality. So um, 
in The Road to Wigan Pier, which is his first book where he is a deeply committed socialist, a lot of the second half of The Road to Wigan Pier is taken up with attacking socialists, not attacking socialism, but attacking socialists, uh, because, they're, because they believe in progress and they believe in uh, economic growth. Um, so that's, that's the post-socialist uh, Orwell making its uh, appearance. In your post-socialist chapter, you also deal with Orwell's views of technology, which I find interesting. He's not easily characterized here. He's not a Luddite, so we don't need to make a parody of him. But he is concerned that there are socialists who have a much too sanguine view of what technology can make possible. And here I, I was sort of expecting that his hostility or his suspicion would have to do with the ways – the state can employ technology to manipulate or control the people, but it's not really that. Uh, what is he saying about technology? You know, in in the road to Wigan Pier, you get this strong anti tech. I mean, he didn't use the word anti technology. He said uh, against the machine or against um, mechanical progress, that kind of thing. Uh, he's extremely. Uh, um, how can I put it? Uh, disenchanted with the whole idea that that the world is going to become a better place through technology um, and in, you know, in our language. Um, <clears throat> so uh, he disparages uh, technological innovation and economic growth. Now, after 1936, he gradually and fitfully becomes a bit more pro-technology. I do want to say something, of course, about not just his ideas – in the abstract, but how they manifest themselves in the novels. But the novels that I think I'm familiar with are the ones virtually everybody is familiar with, and that's Animal Farm in 1984. In fact, I'm so exclusively familiar with those that I would I would have wondered if there was any value in reading his earlier work. What would you say about that? I would say he, that two of his novels, apart from those two, are very good and worth reading. Burmese Days, which is his first novel, second book, but first novel, um, is about life in Burma as uh, a, police, a British police officer under the British Empire, which he had, you know, that was that was his experience. Uh, it's quite good. I mean, it's I would say it's the second best novel about the British Empire after Passage to India by Forster. Uh, the other book that's quite good is um, Coming Up for Air. That would be um, 1938 or 39, um, and that's um, that, that's a, that's a good novel. Uh, he, the, the, he, two other novels are, pr are pretty poor, uh, and would only be worth reading if you're you have an intense interest in Orwell specifically. And they are the cl a clergyman's daughter, and uh, keep the aspidistra flying. Although I think keep the aspidistra flying. Uh, is a lot better than A Clergyman's Daughter. A Clergyman's Daughter is a, is a terrible failure as a novel, I think. All right. Well, I, I wasn't familiar with those, so, so that's good. I do want to talk about Animal Farm for a moment. Now, I realize the way you've organized your book is not by novel or chronological period necessarily, but as I say, looking at Orwell under different aspects. But nevertheless, I want to conduct this a certain way. I want to talk about uh, Animal Farm. I remember reading that as a kid, enjoying it on a surface level, and then later putting together what the real message was and enjoying it on a deeper level. Um, I'm curious about what you can tell us about that novel, about uh, what he was setting out to do, given that it clearly is a critique of a socialist society. So I guess we have to we're, we're going to be learning something about his views of the Soviet Union. Right. And so what were they, and and what's going on with this book? Uh, well, Animal Farm is definitely uh, an allegory of the Russian Revolution and what became of the Soviet regime. And that's very clear from everything he said about it. And it's very clear, you know, it, it's, it sometimes follows events in the Russian Revolution almost pedantically. So that's what it's about. Um, what happened to Orwell was this. On May 3rd, 1937, while he was fighting in Spain. He went to fight in Spain, like so many left-wingers did, for the Republic against the nationalists. He was in Barcelona on, on leave from the front for a short period. Uh, he suddenly found himself in the middle of street fighting 
And this is street fighting Barcelona style, in other words, with uh, rifles and grenades, right? It's, <laughs> it's that kind of street fighting. And um, essentially what was happening, although Orwell didn't really understand this, was that the Communist Party was eliminating uh, the left. There was a civil war within the left in Spain, as well as the civil war between left and right. And Orwell became a hunted fugitive because he was so associated with this group that was to the left of the Communist Party. And uh, he managed to get back to England. He could easily have been caught and killed by the Communist-controlled police, uh, but he managed to get back to England. And when he got back to England, he found that no one, well, that's, I'm exaggerating, the way Orwell did, actually. Few people in respectable positions would listen to his account of what the communists had done in Spain. Uh, basically, they had they had butchered the left, everybody to the left of them. And they'd done this, of course, um, in pursuit of their own total uh, monopoly power in order to set up a totalitarian regime in, in uh, Spain. Now, um, Orwell was very shocked to find that uh, a completely misleading and inaccurate account of what had happened in this street fighting in Barcelona uh, was being disseminated by the communists and su successfully disseminated in all sorts of non-communist uh, publications as well. And that led him to write the book um, Homage to Catalonia, where he he described his experiences in Spain. And uh, it's a very anti-communist book. So his experiences in Spain influenced him to become extremely anti-communist. So that's basically what lay... And he, of course, he had to explain how a socialist revolution had led to this horrible phenomenon of uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the communist movement. Uh, and uh, that, that's what led him to um, eventually write Animal Farm. What do you mean by your chapter title, The Inadvertent Anti-Socialist? Well, in that chapter, I'm taking issue with, a, with a, a view that's very common about Orwell among people who write about Orwell a lot. Um, most people who write a lot about Orwell are left wing uh, and, and they very much like Orwell. And they're, they're off, they often display a lot of indignation that the right uh, appropriates Orwell in, in their view. And there is there is a, a view that, that is that goes like this: um, Orwell's 1984 couldn't possibly be an anti-socialist work because we can show by chapter and verse that Orwell was a socialist. And uh, of course, it's true that Orwell was a socialist, and that can be shown by chapter and verse. Uh, my argument is that he was inadvertently anti-socialist uh, in the sense that he criticized uh, totalitarianism from the point of view of democratic socialism. Uh, but if you take the view that democratic socialism is an impossibility, which I do, uh, then, of course, his criticism of totalitarianism becomes a criticism of socialism. So that's, that's the argument in that chapter. In a way, I feel like this is an unfair question because I'm asking you to read his mind, but maybe we can speculate on this. On the one hand, you're describing to me a man who believes in socialism, as we might call it, in the classical sense, with collective ownership of the means of production, which in practice always meant state ownership of the means of production. Right. And this also, you're saying, in, involves controlling people's incomes, a, a very minute set of, of uh, controls over the economy. And yet at the same time, he theorizes about the dangers of the state. And you wonder, how, well, how does he expect if the state owns everything, how could anybody resist the totalitarian regimes he's describing? I can't even get, of course, maybe he didn't have copy machines in his day, but they, you know, they had something, you know, they, uh, how could I get a printing press? How could I release books if the government owns all those things? There's no way to resist it. If, if the government owns everything, where could the resistance ever get its own means of production from? How does he confront that or does he? Right. Um, you know, I think I think we have to understand that Orwell's general view on this matter was very typical of 1930s intellectuals in the in the English speaking world, especially in Britain. 
the general view, if you had accosted a typical British leftist, let's say a New Statesman reader in the 1930s and said, well, what, look at the way things have turned out in Russia, the reply would have been, uh, well, um, that's due to peculiar circumstances in Russia. When it happens here, it'll be totally different and things will, there'll be just as much freedom on the personal level, just as much um, freedom of expression, freedom of thought as there is now, or even more, because the capitalist monopolists won't be distorting everything in the press and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, that, so that, so Orwell's view is a very common view. Um, it's not, it, there's nothing strange about it, you know, in, in the context of 1930s left-wing thinking. Uh, the general view was when we when we get uh, a socialist system, uh, there will be civil liberties, there will be freedom. Um, and of course, um, books like Hayek's Road to Serfdom were partly written out of a desire to combat that assumption and to say, well, no, if you do this, uh, you're going to have these consequences. And Orwell reviewed The Road to Serfdom by Hayek uh, in 1944 when it came out, and he liked it, uh, he, and uh, he wasn't convinced, uh, but it helped to uh, deepen his fear that maybe socialism was going to lead to a horrific political system. Yeah, now, I actually, it's funny, I was already thinking of The Road to Serfdom before you said that, because I think even just from this conversation, I've actually gained a greater appreciation for that book, because now I'm appreciating more the context of it, because you clearly do have people who think you can have what you and I would describe as a totalitarian economic system and not have that spill over into other aspects of life, which today seems so preposterously naive and implausible. It's hard to believe anybody ever, ever believed it. So then what is what is Orwell really warning against in 1984? If socialism doesn't have to have politically bad consequences so it's not is, is it therefore it's not socialism that he's uh, warning us against what's he warning us against uh, he's warning us against giving up on democracy and when when orwell uses the term democracy he's primarily thinking of civil liberties rather than majority vote and he's i mean orwell's taking the view that um collectivism is uh, is the only uh, thing that can possibly happen in the near future. There can be no survival of capitalism. There can only be a movement to collectivism. That's a, that's a, a kind of factual proposition he was absolutely convinced of, and he reiterates this throughout his life. Um, it constantly says, laissez-faire capitalism is finished. And if you look at the context, he doesn't just mean laissez-faire capitalism. He means any kind of capitalism in the sense of private ownership of the means of production. So he's absolutely convinced that uh, that capitalism is at the end of its rope. Uh, it can't last much longer. Um, and he wants so, – so in his mind, the choice is between what he calls oligarchical collectivism, which is what he, as he keeps saying – is the system in the Soviet Union and in the Third Reich, um, and um, <clears throat> democratic socialism, which is uh, a state-owned, planned economy, but keeping liberal values of free speech, free th thought, and so on. So that so that's what that's his view. Um, you know, uh, Orwell died quite young. He died um, <clears throat> at the age of forty-six. Um, and it's easy to imagine that, um, you know, if he'd lived through the 50s, he might have changed his views uh, quite considerably on this whole question. But um, uh, he didn't, unfortunately, uh, survive. And um, so we're stuck with the Orwell who uh, thought that some kind of collectivist economy was absolutely inescapable. All right. You've written a book called Orwell, Your Orwell. So let's finish up by having you make the case for why Orwell matters. Oh, I, th I think Orwell matters because so many people read him and have a view of his thinking, which is often inaccurate and needs a bit of correction. He's a great writer. He's very persuasive. He's... Um, He's the kind of writer who makes you feel that you want that he's on your side and that you re he really agrees with you. Uh, and this is uh, he has a be bewitching, persuasive style, which has led many people to think that he agreed with them on 
things that he just didn't agree with them on. So there are all kinds of things in Orwell uh, that we haven't mentioned, like his, uh, his opposition to homosexuality, for example, which are very unfashionable today, even among Orwell's um, strongest admirers. And uh, another thing would be his opposition to birth control. Uh, his view that, um, that, that one of the primary values of any society worth having is what he called philoprogenitiveness, in other words, a high valuation for having babies. Um, so there are all these things about Orwell's uh, point of view that I bring out in the book, uh, and it, they're, they're really unnoticed by many admirers of Orwell. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, th I think of... Um, OK, let me let me summarize it by saying this, that a lot of people have the view that Orwell is a great writer because he was so often right where others were wrong. I think that's quite wrong. I think Orwell was wrong a lot nearly all the time. Uh, but um, he's a great writer despite that. He's got no, he's a great writer for reasons that have nothing to do with that. And I would say he's a great writer in the sense that Jonathan Swift was a great writer. Uh, today, we don't know much about the political uh, circumstances when Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels, uh, but we know that Gulliver's Travels is a great work. Um, and I think the same, and, and by the way, Swift influenced Orwell more than any other writer. That, that um, Orwell read Swift's Gulliver's Travels at the age of seven, uh, and it made a huge impact upon him. Um, and I think you, things in Gulliver's Travels crop up in 1984 in a quite remarkable extent. Uh, <clears throat> so I would say that uh, to understand Orwell as a great writer, we have to understand him as a great writer whose views on politics were generally wrong. And not just politics. One thing I like about this book is you describe the views of Orwell and then you engage him. You engage with those views and, and you challenge them and give reasons that we might doubt some of them. So it's, a, it's an interesting study. But in particular, I, I guess I do want to ask you one other thing. You also seem skeptical of his portrayal of totalitarianism itself, uh, arguing that it doesn't have to work out precisely the way Orwell does in the somewhat exaggerated fashion of 1984. So I wonder if you could say a word about that. Yes. Um, here, I think we have to guard against the tendency to identify literary criticism with political science. There are all kinds of things in 1984 which make perfect sense artistically. It's a literary creation. It's a work of fiction. It's a satire. So if I say that certain things in 1984 couldn't happen, it do, I'm not criticizing 1984. Uh, as I say in the book, that would be like saying that uh, Gulliver's Travels is nonsense because you can't have human beings who are only five inches tall. That, that would be to miss the point. And uh, so on, a, on, the, on the level of artistic creation, uh, 1984 is a superb work. Uh, and um, what I'm just about to say shouldn't be taken as literary criticism. But <clears throat> things that happen in 1984 couldn't really happen uh, and are not the tendency in totalitarian systems insofar as we've been, been able to analyze them. Uh, the whole idea that you try to destroy the notion of truth, for example, doesn't really make any sense when you think about it. Because if you destroy the notion of truth, then why should people care what the party line is if they know that there is no objective truth? Um, so my, my view is that if, you, if you're engaged in telling lies, you don't want your listeners to disbelieve in the notion of absolute and objective truth. No, you want them to keep on believing that, uh, but to accept your version of the truth. So this, I think, is one of the misunderstandings. Uh, I don't think that um, a lot of the extreme uh, developments in, in, uh, in 1984 uh, could come about or have any tendency to come about. And if we look at the, if we look at the actual Soviet Union, which is the closest thing on a, on a major scale, uh, that we've seen. I suppose some people would say North Korea today is the, is the closest thing. But um, <clears throat> if you look at the development of the Soviet Union, you don't see a development towards denying objective truth or doublethink or any of that kind of thing. You know, it's, it, 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 that's not what happens in real totalitarian systems. 
Um, so, um, yeah, I think I think that as as a piece of political science, uh, it wouldn't be all that great. But then it's not a, a piece of political science. I think there's a bit of a parallel with the political correctness phenomenon, because there a lot of people on the political right think that the politically correct folks are advocating moral relativism, when to the contrary, they have a very distinct moral sense, right. and they are going to ram it down your throat. They are not saying that you, the bigot, have just as much right to your opinion as I, the enlightened person. That is absolutely the opposite of what they're, what they're saying. So it never never quite works out that way. So the book is Orwell, Your Orwell, A Worldview on the Slab. I'm going to be linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 970, 970, the show notes page for today. Of course, you can get it on Amazon. That's where I'll be linking to it. And I appreciate your time, David Ramsey Steele, and your uh, excellent work on on this book. Well, thank you very much. It's been great to be here. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. The Tom Woods show, episode 969. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you like this show, I guarantee you will enjoy my free ebook, Sane Space Libertarian Dispatches from Bizarro America. Grab your copy at sanespacebook.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm out of town today, so I'm going to play for you a talk I gave years ago, probably 2009. And by the way, later this week, I actually have some very engaging guests coming up. If we can get them scheduled this week, it'd really be great. But I think you'll know them when you hear them. I'll try and remember to point them out to you. But I've got some guests coming up that I know you're going to want to hear from. But for now, I do have this talk from 2009. It's quite some time ago, I suppose. But this is a talk I delivered, I'm pretty sure, in Philadelphia at a Campaign for Liberty event back in uh, those days they had a practice of, on a Friday night, they'd have rah-rah speeches by me and by Ron Paul and people like that. And then on Saturday, they would have us give more, I wouldn't, maybe theoretical, but more academic-style talks where we would be trying to teach things instead of just rallying people. So one of the things I talked about and the topic for this episode today is the origin of rights. We talk about individual rights a lot, but where do they come from? What are they grounded in? Can they be defended? Are they just arbitrary? So what I do here is really a historical review of different rights theories that have existed over the years. And I, I wonder if today maybe I would do a better job, although I don't think you'll be super duper disappointed or anything, but I've learned a lot since then. But I think this is still a pretty good overview of rights theories going back from the Middle Ages up to the present. And what more could you ask from a podcast than that? So here we go, and I hope you enjoy it. So what we're going to do is talk about individual rights, and I've got an awful lot of material on here. So we're just going to zoom on through it, baby. And if you miss something, you can somehow you can wait eight months for this to come out and, and, and watch it, or you can ask me later. I've also got copies of, of uh, five of my titles available for purchase and I want you to purchase them only on their merits, not because I am telling you that we're expecting our fourth child in February and we're going to need some extra cash. That's irrelevant, okay? Just on their merits, I want you to consider purchasing them. So I guess those of you who are here with me today have got this outline, and I think it's on pink sheets, so we're going to get in touch with our feminine side, start looking at this outline. And so if you have the outline, it's easier to follow along. That's why, I'm, that's why I make them. So first, before we talk about rights, we've got to define what the term means. What exactly is a right? There are a great many definitions of rights, but one that I like and that others in this sort of tradition like comes from a guy who's still alive, Father James Sadowski, who was a professor of business ethics at Fordham for many years, one of the few non-commie professors of business ethics, by the way. And Sadowski's definition is as follows. He says, when we say that one has the right to do certain things, we mean this and this only, that it would be immoral for another, alone or in combination, to stop him from doing this 
by the use of physical force or the threat thereof. Now notice he does not say, in fact, he goes on to clarify this. He says, we do not mean that any use a man makes of his property within the limits set forth is necessarily a moral use. So people may do something that's immoral and still, strictly speaking, be within their rights. So not every vice is or should be criminalized. So you can break promises, by and large. You can be a liar. You can be late all the time. But by and large, these aren't things we're going to throw you in jail for. I mean, strictly speaking, you strictly speaking, you have a natural right to be late, even if it's really annoying. So in other words, a right is, in effect, it's a sphere of action in which you can act and in which it would be morally wrong for anyone to interfere with you violently or with the threat of violence. Now, I think it's been taken for granted by many people that rights and rights language is a relatively recent development in the history of Western civilization. But I think that's not correct. It depends on how you define recent. A lot of people would say, were of the opinion, until relatively recently, that really this is a 17th century development, and John Locke and others were really the first to start talking about rights and using the language of rights. That thesis has by and large been abandoned by scholars. Because it now looks as if the history of rights goes back a lot farther in the history of Western civilization, it goes back at least to the 12th century. So it goes actually back to the Middle Ages, where we start to hear the language of rights. And I refer in my sources at the end of the outline to a book by Brian Tierney called The Idea of Natural Rights, and he's really the pioneer in this area, and he elaborates on some of these points. But we see it all throughout Europe by the, by the 12th century. And we hear it being used in this sense, that the Lord has rights, vassals have rights, popes have rights, kings have rights, cities have rights. So these aren't quite natural rights, because a natural right is a right that's enjoyed by all people by virtue of being human, not by virtue of being a pope or a king or a lord or a vassal. So these aren't natural rights, but nevertheless, the language of rights permeates European society by this time. And even though they're not quite natural rights yet, once you start talking about rights, there's a certain internal dynamic to them that is going to lead us down the path to natural rights. And just to give you one example, medieval cities were really oases of freedom amidst an otherwise uh, social system of, of stagnation, such that the various cities of medieval Europe did enjoy certain rights vis-a-vis -vis political authorities. And they would insist on the expansion of these rights over time. And one of the rights the cities typically enjoyed was that if you lived in a city for a year and a day, undetected, you were free of all servile obligations. So if a serf managed to flee and live in a city for a year and a day, nobody could come and try and take him away. That was one of the rights of the cities, that we can protect these people. So there was a case, for example, when the Count of Flanders happened to be in a nearby city, and he spotted one of his old serfs who had lived there longer than a year and a day, and he, tried, he and his goons tried to snatch him out, and the townspeople drove them out and protected this former serf because they were protecting what was understood to be a traditional right of the cities. So where does natural rights come from? Well, in 1140, we get something called the Decretum of Gratian, Gratian was a canon lawyer. He's interested in the law of the church. And what he's doing for the first time in 1140 is bringing together church law into one single compendium. Up to that point, church law had been a very scattered affair. There had been papal statements, ecumenical councils, local councils, uh, biblical verses, penitentials, and they'd never actually been brought together and systematized into a coherent whole. So Gratian brings a lot of these sources together and publishes the Decretum. But when you look through this Decretum, naturally, if you're bringing together information from many sources, you may find contradictions, you may find duplications, whatever. And so there was a, an attempt to refine Gratian's collection by means of various commentaries and glosses on it. And when the commentators went through the Decretum, one thing they found was the repeated use of a term, use naturale which might variably be rendered as natural law or perhaps even an early form of natural right. And they went and they listed all the different ways in which this term had been used historically. But when they, when they made that list, they added another meaning 
that you actually don't find in the ancient sources. The commentators on Gratian more, more or less uh, invented it. And they said that one of these meanings of this term can be a subjective power enjoyed by individuals. So they are groping toward the idea of a natural right as being something that as individuals, each one of us is entitled to. Now, from the mid-12th century up to 1300, we start to see specific examples of natural rights uh, being put into practice and being recognized. And so I give examples. One of the earliest rights that was recognized by people as being a natural right and therefore preceding any government and being something that no government could overturn was the right to appear and defend yourself against charges in a court of law. That's a natural right that you can't be deprived of by any prince. Likewise, over this 150-year period, we begin to see the development of the ideas of the rights of property, of self-defense, of marriage as being a relationship entered into freely by free individuals exercising their freedom of choice, and still other areas. And these, again, being rights that inhere in the person as a person and that people can't be deprived of by any political authority. So these are natural rights and cannot be taken away by the prince. Now, because they're talking about natural rights, they are not claiming, even though this is a, a deeply Christian milieu, they are not claiming that Christians enjoy these rights, but if you're not a Christian, you know, we can, you know, knock your block off or something. To the contrary, in the mid-13th century, Pope Innocent IV made a statement that future commentators referred to quite often Innocent IV said, ownership, possession, and jurisdiction can belong to non-believers licitly, for these things were made not only for the faithful, but for every rational creature. Well, that is the very heart of the idea of natural rights. Now, we move forward several centuries to the age of discovery. By the way, if there's anybody out here who has uh, bottled water that has not yet been opened, by the way, and consumed, um, if I could have a little liquidity, the good kind, uh, that would be a huge help to me. But uh, so any, any administrative people who happen to hear this, that'd be super helpful. Um, in any event, we're going to move to the, the age of discovery. It's particularly, we want to look at Spain, Spain's interaction with the natives of the New World. Because we all know, we hear all, all the time about the crimes of Columbus and the crimes of the conquistadors. But what we don't hear so much about is the crisis of conscience that this provoked in Spanish philosophers and theologians. Because in the 16th century, particularly around the University of Salamanca in Spain, you get Spanish philosophers asking the question, should we be acting this way? Should we be treating these natives like garbage? Or should we not recognize in them a common spark of humanity that would in turn demand of us that we extend to them the same rights that we would extend to our fellow Europeans? And what we find is that one of the silver linings amidst the demographic disaster that struck the natives of the New World was that it provoked this kind of soul-searching on the part of Spanish intellectuals. And so it was at this moment that we start to hear the idea really taking root of natural rights, of norms that govern the conduct of states, that states aren't just generators of, of powers, that states in fact have to be subject to the moral law. They're not morally autonomous. And so therefore the Spanish government can't just behave however it wishes toward these people. Francisco de Vitoria is considered to be one of the founders of international law. Now, we hear international law and we think boo, hiss, but all he means by it is not a United Nations. All he means by it is simply that there is a single standard of justice that applies to all people. Now, this is not a common thing to come across in the world, this emphasis on there being a single standard of justice that applies to me and to my people just as much as it applies to you and your people. Uh, I, I mean, we don't have any record of Attila the Hun sitting back and saying, gosh, should I really be treating people this way or should I maybe stop these conquests in the name of natural rights? You know, I mean, I mean, he was apparently he was asked once, you know, how come you're looting and pillaging and stealing stuff from people? And he said, well, I don't know, because I want to take people's stuff. Like, why are you even asking me the question? Or or likewise, the Harvard historian Samuel Elliott Morrison points out that a number of the North American tribes, uh, Indian tribes, they had the same word for the people 
as they had for members of our tribe, and the same word for enemy or son of the she-dog or whatever, they would apply to members of other tribes. Now, if you're going to think in that way, you're never going to reach a level at which you can make a universal statement about universal, uh, universally applicable natural rights. So this is a rarity in the history of the world. So Francisco de Vitoria uh, argues that the natives are rational, so they enjoy, they, they possess the distinguishing characteristic of human beings, and they are created in God's image, and therefore they, they are entitled to the same treatment we would accord to our fellow Europeans. He says that they may not have their property taken from them. They, not, they may not be, in other words, expropriated on the grounds that they can't really be true owners. They're just stupid old natives. No, no, no. No, that's not right. Uh, he says, to the contrary, uh, the Aborigines undoubtedly have true dominion in both public and private matters, just like Christians, and neither their princes nor private persons could be despoiled of their property on the ground of their not being true owners. So they have the rights to property just the same way everyone else has. Domingo de Soto, his colleague, again insisted natural rights apply to and are enjoyed by all people. De Soto said, those who are in the grace of God are not a whit better off than the sinner or the pagan in what concerns natural rights. So this is by and large the opposite of what people think Christians believe. You know, we Christians get to do things and we get to kill everybody else. That's really not what the mature uh, late scholastics of, of uh, 16th century University of Salamanca are saying. And they conclude, moreover, that the natural law, as St. Paul says in the Bible, is written on the human heart. We have an, a, a sense of what's right and wrong. We, we kind of know instinctively what's right and wrong. Sometimes this sense needs to be refined or uh, to some degree corrected, but we have a, a basic sense of right and wrong. And because we all possess this, and this is something that brutes do not possess, you know, an aardvark doesn't have an internal sense of moral right and wrong, but human beings do, this therefore links us all in a kind of sublime mystical equality because we all possess this ability to reflect on our actions in light of universal principles written on our hearts. This is something that belongs only to homo sapiens, not to anyone else. And on these grounds, again, this basis of equality and this idea that human beings enjoy a special dignity for this reason, and because they enjoy rationality, they have a certain equality that therefore means that no one of us has any innate particular power to exercise our, uh, arbitrary power over anybody else. We all have a certain equality on, this, on these grounds. Now, a figure people have heard of more, I think, than Francisco de Vitoria or Domingo de Soto is, of course, John Locke, the 17th century, by and large, figure who died in 1704. John Locke, of course, is deeply influential and uh, very much influences Thomas Jefferson with the Declaration of Independence, naturally. And he's going to talk about natural rights deriving from the idea of self-ownership, the idea that you own yourself. Now, that's not an idea that Locke invented. From what I can see, the first figure to actually talk about this idea of, net, of, of a right of self-ownership is a, a 13th century scholastic philosopher named Henry of Ghent, and I think he died around 1293. So this, is, this long precedes John Locke, but Locke really gives a lot of meat to the idea. And I know when people hear self-ownership, some people feel funny about this. How could you really own yourself? And First of all, we have to understand what's meant by ownership in this case. All that's meant by ownership is range of control. So who has the best moral claim to exercise a range of control over your physical body? Who has a better claim than you yourself? Okay, and then even if we want to get really graphic about it, suppose I actually want to donate a kidney to save my daughter or something. I would have the moral claim to do that, Nobody else could come up to me and say, hey, by the way, I'm going to start yanking body parts out of you. Right? We would immediately, we instinctively recognize that we as individuals have the greatest moral claim to exercise a range of control over our own bodies. Now, an objection that we hear sometimes, I think, from religious people would be that, but doesn't God own everybody? Isn't it kind of impious to claim that you own yourself? But I think the answer to that is, again, we're talking just about range of control, and we're talking about our control over our bodies vis-a-vis -vis other people. Certainly vis-a-vis -vis other people, no one has a better claim than I have. But beyond that, if it's true that God created all things, he created the whole world, he created the earth, he created all the land, well, nobody has any hesitation in saying, I own this land. 
so, but no one comes up to him and says, now, wait a minute, God owns the land. You have no right to have a deed to this land. So I think if you were to make that argument, it would, it would abolish all ownership. So I think, I think that's not, that's not really a concern. Now, self-ownership is a Lockean principle, and what follows from that is the right of private property. And that right derives from, according to Locke, we have a situation in which there is no, beginning of the world, the world is, is given to us sort of in common, in, in his view, and no one individual has any particular claim on any one thing yet, until such time as people exercise their labor upon some previously unowned good. So I, you know, I cultivate some soil. I pick some berries, whatever. I mix my labor with the fruits of the earth, and that becomes an extension of me. It becomes an extension of my self-ownership. I then have domain over those things that I've mixed my labor with. And then after I mix my labor with them, I can sell them. So the next person doesn't have to constantly be mixing his labor. We're talking about only about previously unowned things. Once they come into ownership by means of my mixing my labor with them, then I can transfer them to other people by means of gifts, will bequests, or sale. And this is how we come to own things. Now, Locke says that there are certain inconveniences. Now, the word inconveniences had a stronger connotation at the time he wrote than it does today, but there were inconveniences of the state of nature. And by state of nature, he means a pre-political world before there were governments in which all of us were pursuing our natural rights to our lives and our liberty, to, to the domain of control over our bodies, but that prior to the establishment of a government, we enjoy these things, according to him, only precariously. Um, and you don't need, there's no need to, to dwell on this, but I'll just say very quickly, for example, uh, in the state of nature, there's no body of universally recognized law we can appeal to. There's no reliable law enforcement. And thirdly, we have the problem of people being very bad judges in their own cases. People are going to tend to side with themselves if a case of conflict should arise. So according to Locke, we need to remedy these deficiencies by means of civil government, and we therefore delegate to that civil government some portion of the rights we would enjoy completely in the state of nature. We delegate some of these, for example, perhaps some of our self-defense, uh, like for example, uh, judicial services. We would delegate that to, to governments. And so governments would be there to perform just night watchman services, to simply to protect rights of property and, and right to life, and that would be it. And if they try to exercise powers beyond these that are strictly necessary for these purposes, then the people would have the power to abolish that government, because then that government would be interfering with rather than protecting their rights. Now, a much more recent figure, and I know how fast this is. This is super fast, but that's what an intro is, baby, and then it makes you want to read more, because I know that's what we all need in this room. We're saying, man, oh man, I wish I had something to read, you know? <laughs> Well, the next guy I want to talk about is much more recent. He died only very recently. Robert Nozick was a Harvard philosopher. What's very significant about him is that his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia from 1974, is a very rare case of a professional philosopher who's very respected at a top university taking liberty arguments seriously. And that's what he does in this book. And he argues for a minimal state that exists for the provision of rights protection services, but no other. That's, that's, that's what the state is confined to. Now, he was criticized in an article called Libertarianism Without Foundations because he doesn't give an express account of how people come to enjoy rights or what the source of people's rights might be. He doesn't talk about this expressly in the book. So he was criticized for this. Well, you're just arbitrarily making assertions. But his defense to this undoubtedly would be that in this book he is making an appeal to principles that everybody would take for granted. There's no, there's no obvious need to belabor the point by giving you a 30 chapter explanation of why slavery is wrong. So I think I can, you know, I've already got a pretty big book here in Anarchy, State, and Utopia. I assume I can take for granted that uh, people are against slavery. You know, I'm going to assume that they already know slavery is bad. So if I then turn around and say, hey, this thing is just like slavery, people will understand that this thing is bad. Or conversely, any form of forced labor. Again, he's assuming that the general run of mankind takes for granted that forced labor is morally wrong. So if he can show that something that the government does is just like forced labor, then 
Likewise, we can say that that's morally wrong without having to go into a lengthy exposition of why forced labor is wrong. This is a moral intuition most people already hold. And so this is right out of his book. He says, and this is Roman numeral four, part C. He says, taking the earnings of N hours labor is like taking N hours from the person. It is like forcing the person to work N hours for another's purpose. And that's why he argued that an income tax was on a par with forced labor. Because how is it conceptually different? And this drove philosophers crazy. They just, so, I mean, if the best argument you can come up with is, well, you never explained why forced labor is bad. But you know you want, right? That's that's what they come up with. Now, on the next page here, we've got um, an even more radical exposition of natural rights, and this is at the hands of Murray Rothbard, 1926 to 1995. Now, Rothbard, in effect, extends Locke's analysis, and he believes Locke is sort of inconsistent. He makes concessions that he shouldn't make, and Rothbard just eliminates all the concessions. His argument is that the only defensible philosophical position is 100% self-ownership. That there's no, there's, there's no other, there's no alternative. And by the way, now I see I actually have plenty of time, so now I'm going to slow it, slow it down a little. Slow down. Okay. All right. I, I didn't think I'd ever get through this. And now here we are, page two. Okay. <laughs> so Rothbard starts with the principle of self-ownership, and he derives that in part indirectly, by considering what would the alternatives be to 100% self-ownership? What, 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 what other possible systems could there be? And if I can show that those systems either don't work or lead to absurdities or fail to answer the question as posed, then we're left with the only alternative, which would be 100% self-ownership. So he offers in his book, The Ethics of Liberty, 1982 or three. He offers three possible alternatives. I think it's 82. He says, first of all, and this is in a, just in a footnote, he says, suppose we had a system in which nobody owns anybody. Nobody owns himself or anybody else. What would be the result of a system like that? Well, again, if we consider the meaning of ownership in this sense as being exercising a range of control, well, then in that case, if nobody owns anybody, including himself, Nobody could eat, nobody could breathe, because no one would have legitimate range of control over his own body. No one, no one would have the permission, in effect, to do anything. So everybody would be dead. So this can't be right. The idea that no one should have range of control over anyone, including himself, can't possibly work. Secondly, everybody owns everyone, or maybe slightly more accurate, everybody owns a portion of everyone else. This would be a possible sort of communism of bodies. Everybody has got a, owns a portion of himself, but also owns a portion of every other person. All right, well, how, how's that going to work? Right? I mean, again, if ownership implies range of control, that would mean I have a range of control over every single other person. So nobody can actually do anything unless they've gotten my consent and the consent of everybody else. Well, again, this is obviously absurd. There's no way this could, this could persist. And if, obviously, if you have a society of a whole lot of people, how, how could everybody keep tabs on everybody else and say, now, wait a minute, you know, I haven't, I haven't given my 4% vote on your body yet, so you're going to have to just stay and wait. It would be impractical, even if it could be done. So what would inevitably have to happen would be you'd have to have some sort of uh, Kremlin-type Politburo situation where the Politburo will decide what to do with everybody's bodies. And then that would lead us into the third possibility, partial ownership of one group by another. So there's another possibility. Let's suppose uh, we have a, a situation in which um, one group of people owns, uh, they all own themselves, but they also own um, another group of people in the society. Well, there, I mean, Rothbard has a couple arguments against this, but one of them is this fails to answer what it is we're, we're searching for. We're searching for a universal ethic for man, for mankind, that would apply to man qua man. Now, if you're going to say that, well, the correct ethic would be that people with red hair get to dominate people with black hair, that's not an ethic for man. That's, un, that's, that, that's an ethic for one group of people. We're looking for a universal standard that would apply to everybody. So this doesn't even meet the definition of what we're, we're seeking. So this is, this is excluded. 
So according to Rothbard, the only alternative that's left is self-ownership, is 100% self-ownership of each person by himself. Now, if you notice immediately, uh, I, I think, the extremely radical political implications of Rothbard's conclusion, which would be, if there is such a thing as one, if, if, if we have 100% self-ownership, then, according to him, any form of aggression against the individual is morally unjustifiable including taxation. That would be morally unjustifiable because that would be a kind of theft by, from one group uh, preying upon another, and that would be a violation of the self-ownership of the people being taxed. And he would say that there has to be one standard of morality that is universally applied to all people. And one thing that would fail that test is, I can steal, but you can't. I can hit you, but you can't hit me. That type of ethic is not universal. And so, therefore, if a government is going to try to exercise a non-universal ethic and say, well, we can take, but you can't, or we can expropriate you in order to protect you from expropriators, this is not a universal ethic, and it violates the, the tenets of self-ownership. So that's why Rothbard rejects the state altogether. He, he, would, he moves beyond the minimal state of Locke and Nozick to say that even the minimal state violates rights and therefore can't be justified. Now, oh, wow, hey. I'm, I'm just telling you the stuff, okay? I'm not taking sides here. I'm just telling you. Nobody believes me. All right. Okay. But, I mean, I'm trying to be fair to everybody here. Okay, now, finally, you'll notice that I've got like a 58-page <laughs> last example, not because it's the most important, um, but simply because the argument is very unfamiliar to people, I think, and it's, it's much easier to follow just going on here. In fact, I'm even going to, to make it even simpler. Under Roman numeral 6, I'm going to strike out um, letter D altogether. We're just going to strike it out and make it even simpler. So here what I want to talk about is a, is a very interesting, relatively recent attempt to ground the idea of natural rights on a somewhat different foundation. And so what you find, and, and you know, you may find some of these things persuasive and some not. You may find all of them persuasive. But the fact that we can make this argument from numerous different angles, and yet it leads us to the same basic conclusion of the existence of natural rights. I don't think that's a weakness. I think that's a strength. I think that shows that it's a truth that, albeit perhaps from somewhat different angles, we're all approaching from, from different ways. So Hans Hermann Hoppe, who just turned 60 this year, is still alive, lives in, in Europe. Um, I remember uh, it, he, well, he's, he's offered a, his own version of things, and one of my uh, most memorable interactions with him was seeing him probably four years ago, five years ago, and telling him that uh, I had a, a, a new... Oh, he came up to me and said, oh, I, I, I see you have a new book uh, that, that is coming out. And, uh, that, 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 that is good and whatever. So that's my best German German accent I can do. So I said, yeah, yeah, but even better, you know, we've got great news. We have another another baby coming. This was our, our third. And, uh, and, and he said, oh, congratulations. I said, yeah. I said, I don't... It seems like we're doing like one baby per book at that point. Like it was like every time a book came out, there was a baby, like all the time. And he said, well, I don't know if you can keep up that pace. <laughs> and I walked away not knowing, does he mean books or babies? Right? <laughs> no, anyway. All right. Well, so Hans Hoppe, in, I, I, I think, although he's, he's, he, he gets a lot of criticism, I think... Uh, Un unjustifiably, I think he's an extremely original and important thinker for people, for people to read. I mean, one of the people whose books really changed my way of thinking, I mean, really jolted me into thinking in new and original and, and I hope exciting ways, is Hans Hoppe. In fact, when I got my wisdom teeth pulled, I sat in bed and I, you know, I'm all medicated up, and I don't know where I am, and I'm trying to read his book called A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. And my mother thought how quaint this was, that here's my little son trying his best to, to read this theoretical treatise. But um, I, I highly recommend Hoppe's work. Very, very original, extremely interesting. Well, one thing Hoppe tries to do, and this is probably the, one of the most controversial things he's done. I, I think his, he's done a lot of great stuff in economics. He's done great stuff in philosophy. Probably the most controversial thing he's tried to do is something called argumentation ethics. And the groundwork for argumentation ethics is the recognition of the following things. And I've described these things as scarcity and its implications. We're living in a world of scarce resources in the sense that we do not have enough resources 
for, and, and that, and resources would include labor power as well, for all of us simultaneously to pursue all the ends we may want to pursue. We are inevitably faced with scarcity. Because resources are scarce, they're not super abundant like air. Like, uh, supposing we have clean air, air is so super abundant, we don't argue about it. We don't allocate property rights to air in, in most cases. Because it's so super abundant, no one argues about it or cares. But most goods are not, do not exist in super abundance. They're scarce. And because scarce resources exist, and because my exercise of a range of control over one thing precludes your simultaneous exercise of a range of control over that thing, the potential for conflict exists by virtue of the existence of scarcity. So if we want to live peacefully in society, given the possibility of conflict that scarcity introduces, we need a peaceful, objective, conflict-avoiding system of property ownership that would assign these scarce resources to some owner who can exercise a range of control over them. So peaceful, well, that's obvious. Again, if we're looking to avoid conflict, we need peace. But also objective. Whatever it is that links me with the good that I exercise control over needs to be something that can be recognized by everyone that is objective. It can't just be, I've got a feeling that I should own such and such. Well, you might have the feeling that you should own it, and that doesn't avoid conflict at all. So it needs to be an objective link between the person and the object owned in order to avoid conflict. So the system that we're looking for that will reduce conflicts is a system that is going to specify which individuals may exercise uh, enforceable control over which things. Because if you have a right, it doesn't mean anything if you're not allowed to enforce it. I mean, you can talk all day long about your property rights while the government is is, is uh, bulldozing your house. So the, the ability to enforce the right is important. So this is what rights theory and interpersonal ethics are, are seeking to address. Now, I think it's also important as a prelimin preliminary step to observe that everybody, even thieves, even communists, even fascists, Everybody presupposes a theory of rights and ownership. Everybody does. Because the communists are not saying nobody should own anything. They're not saying no one should exercise a range of control over anything. They're saying these people should exercise that range of control, not these exploiters. A thief is saying, I should have control over these goods because I'm big and strong and I've got a gun and I can take them from you, and you shouldn't. So in effect, he also has a theory. It's a, it's a crummy theory. But he, he does believe, he's not saying no one should exercise control over anything. Everybody's got some theory as to who should control property. Bureaucrats, governments, thieves, uh, whatever, free individuals. Everybody's got some understanding of, of how ownership should be conferred. But what's controversial about Hans Hoppe's argumentation ethics is he's arguing that only the libertarian theory of property can actually be rationally justified. You can have a million theories. This is the only one that can be rationally justified in an argument. Now, how does he come to this very uh, sort of shocking conclusion? And by the way, by libertarian theory of rights and ownership, all he means is the idea really that comes from Locke and uh, you know, perhaps purified by Rothbard, the idea that the owner of something is either the first user of the thing, as in the case of a, of a previously unowned good, or the transferee of that good by means of gift or bequest or sale. That's the libertarian theory of, of rights and property ownership. And he's arguing this is the only one that can be argue, that can be argumentatively justified. Now, according to, to Hoppe, any type of normative proposition you might want to advance has to be advanced in the course of an argument. We don't come into the, this world with normative arguments already emblazoned on our brains. We have to hear them. We have to come to understand them, and then using our reason, rationally come to accept them. So we have to engage in the practical activity. We're not disembodied ghosts. We are real human beings who need to learn things in the course of a, the give and take of discourse and argument. Now, therefore, Hoppe says that given how important argument is to reaching conclusions, particularly to reaching conclusions about how society should be organized, and what rights there are, and who can do what. Well, if there are 
norms of argumentation that are presupposed by everyone who engages in argument, then it becomes logically impossible to argue against these norms and be consistent. And according to Hoppe, the only uh, property assignment rules that can be consistently advanced in argumentation, such that you are not contradicting yourself, is the libertarian one. So, for instance, you can't argue that argument is impossible because you're contradicting yourself, right? You're making an argument that you can't argue. Or you couldn't try to reason that reason doesn't exist. Well, you're using reason, right, in, in the very act of trying to do it. So you're contradicting yourself through your actions. So Hoppe, in effect, is going to say that you cannot, in a non-contradictory way, advance any competing theory of, of ownership titles, so, so let's, let's um, examine this in a little bit more detail here. He says, I think I've covered this, um, the act of argumentation itself takes certain norms for granted. To argue coherently, one cannot deny the very norms that really that are presupposed by the participants as being true. So really what Hoppe is saying is that, you know, I, I Hans Hoppe, I'm a libertarian, but really so are you. You just don't realize it. That every time we engage in argument, we're temporarily all being libertarians. Because what we're engaged in is a peaceful attempt to persuade someone of a proposition. It's not an attempt to persuade them by saying, look, I'm going to argue with you for a little while, but if you don't accept what I'm saying, then I'm going to clock you over the head. Well, that's not argumentation by definition. That's a threat. Argumentation is a peaceful, conflict-avoiding way of reaching conclusions. And so when you're engaged in it, you are in effect, demonstrating your preference for peaceful, conflict-free paths to resolving disputes. And so when you're arguing, you are, in effect, giving voice and giving action to these, basically, this very libertarian way of understanding that I am, I am recognizing your right to control your body and listen to me, and I'm not going to hit you over the head or otherwise I wouldn't be engaged in argument anymore. And, and, and I recognize my ability to exercise control over my body. So we're sort of taking for granted certain norms already as soon as we engage in argument. And we're convincing people through persuasion and with reason and with respect for that person's rational faculties and physical integrity. So uh, what are these norms that are implied in the very act of argumentation? Well, the first such norm, I've already implied a couple, you know, that we, we favor peaceful rather than violent uh, resolutions of our disputes. But the first norm that he, that he talks about is universalizability. And all that means is that if I'm going to propose a rule that I think people in society should follow, this rule has to be universalizable. That is to say, I need to be able to state the rule in such a way that it would apply universally to all people simultaneously. So, for example... Uh, if I were to say, I can hit you, but you can't hit me, that's not a universalizable rule. Because that's actually saying some subset of people, namely me, gets to hit you, but you don't get to hit me. This is, this is not universal, because you're not able to exercise the same power that I'm able to exercise. This is what we would call a particularist rule that singles out an individual or a group of individuals. It says, we get to do certain things to the rest of you. Well, that's not a universalizable rule. Because then that doesn't apply to the rest. So it's not universal. It's, it's particularist. And the reason he argues that what, what Hans is going to say here is that argumentation takes for granted the principle that the rules we live by are, uni are universalizable. And it, it takes that for granted because, number one, argumentation is a peaceful, conflict-avoiding activity. It does not involve violence. It involves persuasion only. Therefore... In principle, any argument we offer has to, in principle, be acceptable to all people. Otherwise, there'd be no way we could argue for it rationally. There'd be no way we could rationally expect everybody to accept a particularist norm. I get to hit you, but you don't get to hit me. It's very, very hard to expect people everywhere to accept that in argument. The only way you could get them to accept it is by enslaving them or drugging them or whatever. But in under the terms of argumentation, which is a peaceful, non-coerced method of interacting, the only way you could expect somebody to accept a norm, a rule of living that's being proposed is that it would have to be universalizable. Or if it is particularist, the reason for the particularism would have to be understood to the reasons. So for example, um, authorized personnel only. That's a particularist rule. 
But there's an objective reason behind it that all of us can recognize. Like, I don't know what would happen if I went behind there because I don't know how to deal with electronics or something and I'd blow myself up. That's a rational, objective reason we can understand there. But unless there is some rational, universally acknowledgeable reason to justify a particularist rule, you can't. They have to be universalizable. Now, so right away, the universalizability, right away it rules out certain norms. Right away it rules out socialism. I, I can take from you, you can't take from me. Socialism doesn't even pass the first norm of, of argumentation. But, but universalizability is necessary but not sufficient. Because it's also universalizable to say everybody should get drunk on Friday night. Uh, it's, yeah, people are clapping for that, yeah. But likewise, it's also universalizable to say uh, everyone should be executed for drinking on a Friday night. So universalizability is not sufficient, but it's a beginning. Now let's skip down to, to, to letter E. When we are engaged in argumentation, we are acknowledging that we value the ability to use things. First of all, I value the ability to use my own body to engage in the argumentation. I value the ability to use the things that keep me alive, that make it possible for me to be standing here making this argument. Right away, we automatically acknowledge that we value the ability to use things. What the norms of argumentation in turn do is that they presuppose a certain way of assigning rights to the use of these things. So, argumentation, in other words, is a kind of filter. The norms we take for granted when we engage in argumentation filter out certain types of norms right off the bat. So they rule out a norm like, no one may ever use any scarce resources. That, that's contradicted in the very act of arguing it, because you're using the scarce resources of your vocal cords, your body, the food that keeps you alive, the standing room where you're standing. Those are all scarce resources. So you can't, in a non-contradictory way, make that argument. So a norm like that is ruled out by the very norms of argumentation itself. Uh, you could say there's a logical uh, factor that's ruled out by argumentation. Contradictions. Trying to argue for a contradiction is ruled out by the norms of argumentation. Because argumentation takes for granted that in a peaceful way you can expect to persuade the whole world, at least in principle. There's no way you can persuade the whole world of a contradiction, because contradictions are, are untrue. But the argumentation also rules out particularistic norms. I can hit you, you can't hit me. Again, the world could not be expected to accept this uh, in, in argument. So given, again, that argumentation is a peaceful, conflict-avoiding uh, way of dealing with disagreements, this now leads us to the last part, F, which is libertarian property rights. According to Hoppe, only libertarianism, the libertarian first user, I'm the first one who's mixed my labor with this unowned resource, and then I can transfer it to subsequent owners, only this norm can be argumentatively justified in discourse because First, it is an objective link. It's not just, I feel like I should own this. This is a link that we can all see. We can all see you mixed your labor with this. Or we can see the receipt you have when you purchase it from the original person who mixed his labor with it. This is an objective link that is available universally for observation by the whole world. And therefore, is one of the first steps in facilitating peaceful social interaction. Um, Secondly, the rule is universalizable because it applies to any conceivable property owner. If he's the first user, then he has the claim. Or if he is the transferee of the first user, then he has the claim. We're not saying only redheads can be owners. This is a universalizable rule, so it satisfies the universalizability requirement. And finally, it's conflict avoiding because everyone can see the objective link linking the owner to the property. It is perceivable to the senses and to the reason. If you were to attempt to assign property titles on any other grounds, let's say we use verbal declaration. So anybody who says property belongs to him is the owner. Would, the, would that be conflict avoiding? Would that be in conformity with the norms taken for granted and presupposed in argumentation? Of course it wouldn't be conflict avoiding. Because anybody could just say, oh, I own that property, and then somebody else could say, no, I do. How, how do we resolve that? And then a third person comes along and uses verbal declaration to say he owns it. So that's not conflict avoiding. Or brute force. So again, that's automatically ruled out. Or how about saying that the third, fourth, and fifth users are really the owners? So then the first user can't even do anything. He's got to sit there and starve until the third or fourth owner shows up. Again, that, that would, that would make argumentation impossible because we'd all be dead. 
So all these factors that we see as norms implied in argumentation or presupposed by the arguers then become filters to filter out competing norms for society such that what we are left with is the libertarian norm of first user private property rights. Now that's probably the shortest space in which this has been explained and it doesn't answer every conceivable question you might have about it, but it is nevertheless, I think, a very intriguing um, account here. And, and it's pointing in the same direction as the other natural rights approaches, but it, it comes at it from a different angle. In fact, when Murray Rothbard first heard Hoppe's argumentation ethics, he said, this is a sweeping and intellectually very exciting new approach to the study of individual rights. He said, it makes my own natural rights approach seem positively wimpy by comparison. So it's quite interesting. It's not accepted by everybody, but I think it's intriguing and worth looking at. Well, now I'm just about at my time, so I'll conclude by saying that although you don't have to believe in natural rights at all to be involved in what we're doing, you could just be a utilitarian and say society just works better if you don't have a Fed and society works better if people aren't killing each other. But there are other people, I think, who are attracted by the moral argument that it's not just more useful if we don't kill each other. It's morally wrong if we kill each other. It's morally wrong if we steal from each other. This is the moral argument that I think is the most compelling and that's at the heart of what we're doing. And the arguments that I've made today and that I've, I've, uh, I've elaborated on from these other thinkers are all pointing in that direction. And it, we have the great privilege of being defenders of this truly liberating and deeply moral teaching. So thank you very much. All right, that's going to do it. Now, if all goes well, and I'm not entirely sure all will go well, but if all goes well, tomorrow we're going to be talking about George Orwell, who is a misunderstood figure in some ways. He's anti-totalitarian, yet he says he's pro-socialist, and yet uh, there are a lot of different th things about him that are hard to make sense of. But I'm going to be joined by an author of a new book on Orwell who thinks he has made sense of the real Orwell, and we're going to have some fun getting to the bottom of that. So I hope you join me for that, episode 970. I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>